Jean Marie Len, pe care am avut onoarea acum o lună de zile să-l avem aici, în această aulă a Universității Vezi din Timișoara și care a acceptat de a fi membru al comunității noastre academice, lucru de care ne mândrim. Jean-Pierre Savage a fost absorbit de lumea fascinantă a științei și de universul nelimitat al chimiei. L-a lăsat pe mentorul său să arate cum se pot dizolva limitele printr-o abordare corectă a muncii și a oamenilor cu care lucrez și, de asemenea, prin abordarea corectă a întregii vieți. Am devenit, au devenit prieteni, au lucrat împreună, deschizând noi domenii de cercetare. Deschis la provocările lumii, domnul Savaj a început să se intereseze de energiile durabile, un domeniu care începea să se contureze și în 1977, împreună cu domnul Len și echipa lor, au publicat un studiu despre primele sisteme care conduceau la reducerea fotochimică a apei în hidrogen. În 1980 și-a fondat propriul grup de cercetare împreună cu doi doctoranți foarte motivați, Pascal Marnot și Roman Rupert. Mai târziu li s-a alăturat Jean-Paul Colin, Marc Belay și Christ Cristin Dietrich. Munca lor în cataliza omogenă și fotochimie anorganică a condus la rezultate spectaculoase. S-au concentrat pe topologia chimică și pe mașini moleculare, dar și pe diverse alte domenii noi de cercetare. Viața l-a purtat în contexte diferite, în echipe de cercetare diferite și în multe universități și laboratoare de cercetare, pentru că deja chimia era modul său de a trăi. În 2016, chimia supramoleculară îl conduce pe laureatul nostru de astăzi și colegii domniei sale, Sir G. Fraser Stoddart și Bernard Feriga, spre obținerea premiului Nobel pentru chimie, un fel de sfântul graal pentru orice cercetător. Totuși, își continuă aventura de descoperire și munca asiduă, rămânând un exemplu de perseverență și deschidere către noile idei. Alegerea de a invita în aula noastră magna și de a deveni doctor honoris causa al universității noastre a avut la bază, pe lângă cariera fabuloasă a domniei sale și simbol aparte, deoarece laureatul nostru s-a născut în același an în care Universitatea de Vest din Timișoara prindea ființă, un an în care Europa și lumea întreagă încerca să renască din cenușa celui de-al doilea război mondial, iar speranța o constituia acordarea educației și științei unui rol mult mai important în viețile noastre. Considerăm că modelul oferit de profesorul Savage este foarte important pentru comunitatea noastră, munca asiduă, respectul pentru trecutul tău și pentru oamenii din viața ta, să nu renunți niciodată să-ți împărtășești cunoștințele tinerilor generații, sunt cheile succesului. Stimate domnule profesor Jean-Pierre Savaj, prin titlul de doctor honoris causa scientiarum oferit astăzi de Universitatea de Vest din Timișoara, vă mulțumesc pentru toată munca, dăria dumneavoastră și pentru faptul că ați oferit tinerilor generații nu doar noi descoperiri și modelul unui om desăvârșit și respectabil. Suntem onorați de prezența domniei voastre la Timișoara și de acceptul de a deveni membru al comunității noastre academice. Vă dorim multă sănătate și puterea de a continua munca asidua pe care o prestați cu aceeași pasiune și dăruire. Vă mulțumesc! Mulțumim, domnule rector. Bineînțeles că vorbeam despre magisteriu, pentru că este rar să ai doi profesori la aceeași universitate, în cazul nostru cea din Strasbourg, premiați cu premiul Nobel în aceeași disciplină, același domeniu, la diferență de câțiva ani. Și... Socrate și pe Platon, sau pe Platon și Aristotel, sau, pentru că după Aristotel s-au cam terminat filozofii mari, pe Aristotel și Alexandru Macedon. Filiațiile acestea sunt. Relația magistru-discipol este cea care a creat civilizația mondială în toate domeniile. Noi am avut privilegiu ca pe parcursul a unei luni și ceva să ne întâlnim și cu magistrul și cu discipolul. În al doilea rând spuneam de mobilitate. Și am să vă rog să faceți un exercițiu de imaginație. 
Născut în Paris, 1944, cum spunea domnul rector, 21 octombrie, părinții Lidi Angel Arslan și Camille André Sovaj, tatăl muzician de jazz apreciat, care după trei ani și-a continuat cariera solo, n-a mai vrut să cânte în formație, dar șansa domnului Sovaj a fost să găsească un tată vitre care, spune el, a fost tată dulce, cum zicem noi românii, tată adevărat, întreaga viață. Și pentru că, spunea el, părinților mei le plăcea să călătorească, tatăl fiind în zona militară, citez, am avut o copilărie foarte mobilă, exerciți de imaginație. Trei ani se mută din Franța în Nordul Africii. Tunisia, Maroc, studiază acolo cu copii arabi alături. E ajuns trei ani, la opt ani este în Statele Unite. Denver, St. Louis. Merge la filme și voi reveni la, un, la o imagine care mi se pare absolut semnificativă. El și părinții ieșind de la un film în St. Louis, în 1951. Apoi, destul și America, destul și Africa, înapoi în, în Europa. Cinci școli între 8 și 10 ani. Alsacia, Normandia, Lorena, deci acum a luat Franța la pas, cum se zice. Imaginați-vă ce experiențe de viață și ce simț al mobilității a putut să-i ofere această copilărie într-atât de dinamică. La 15-16 ani era preocupat, bineînțeles, deja de experiențele cu clorofilă, nu cum spuneam data trecută cu bunul profesor de chimie alături de care să arunce în aer laboratorul, ci cu experiențe personale care i-au descoperit mobilitatea profundă în natură. Așa că eu, deși sunt cu amintiri destul de impersonale legate de chimie, scuze celor atât de mulți specialiști în sală, totuși nu mă mir deloc că specializarea pentru care e recunoscut pe plan mondial este motoarele moleculare. A învățat moleculele să se miște, să fie mobile și să reconstituie oarecum experiența extraordinară de viață, care apoi a cunoscut și Oxford, și Bolonia, și uh, iarăși Paris, uh, cu baza la Strasbourg, bineînțeles, în 67 doctoratul chiar la Jean-Marie Lenn, și echipa extraordinară care s-a definit întotdeauna așa să țineți minte, dragi studenți, dragi prieteni, atmosferă de prietenie desăvârșită, spunea. Nu concurență. Este unul din foarte puțini savanți pentru care prietenia desăvârșită este esența comunicării. Îl laudă pe Jean-Marie Len pentru că, spunea el, n-a pus nici o barieră între domnia sa și noi. Am fost prieteni, am fost colaboratori, am fost alergători, dar nu singurătatea alergătorului de cursă lungă, ci ștafetă, permanență, în care fiecare aleargă și pentru celălalt. Căsătoria cu doamna Carmen, în 1967, preocupată de ceramică antică și specializată acasă la domnul Han Pamuc, primul nostru laureat Nobel din acest an, în poziție. Căsătoria minunată la Tierenbach, acolo unde la Notre-Dame e una dintre cele mai frumoase locații religioase ale Franței. Și o frază care mi-a plăcut foarte mult, nu suntem extrem de religioși, dar suficient de religioși ca să respectăm tradițiile. Nunta aceea a fost una minunată într un cele mai frumoase locuri de pelerinaj, în fiecare duminică e pelerinaj la Tierenbach, la Notre-Dame, în Franța. Charge de Recherche, Fellowship la Oxford, fotosinteză artificială, chimie organică, va fi cine să vă povestească imediat după mine de ce? Jean-Pierre Sauvage este un titan al domeniului său, 
Și este mai mult decât onoare, este un privilegiu să vezi un actor adevărat al lumii științifice live. Pentru amănunte tehnice, nu contați pe mine, aveți aici un prieten foarte bun, domnul Daniel Funeriu, fost ministru al educației, actual ministru în sufletele multora și killer în sufletele altora, omul care a pus problema plagiatului în cultura noastră modernă și, dragi elevi și prieteni, aveți un motiv special să-i mulțumiți și să-l aplaudați, e cel care a introdus camerele supraveghere la bacalaureat. Dragi tineri, să știți că gărzile de corpus afară, așa că dacă vreți să mă atacați pentru camerele de, de luat vederi, nu e asta chiar cel mai bun moment. Vă mulțumesc mult pentru introducere. Înainte să încep ceea ce am a spune, am două anunțuri mici de făcut care nu sunt în script. Primul, prima mea profesoară de chimie, doamna Crâsnic, este în sală și așa modestă cum... Și așa modestă cum este, e în ultimul rând, așa că, doamna profesoară, nu încep până nu veniți în primul rând. Vă scot eu acum la tablă. Mulțumim. Exact, de, pentru că se vorbea de filiație, doamna profesoară Crâsnic mi-a predat mie, după care eu mi-am făcut doctoratul cu același conducător de doctorat ca domnul profesor Sovaj, deci aici este o întreagă filiație. Vă mulțumesc, doamna profesoară. Al doilea, al doilea anunț, pentru că văd foarte multe echipuri tinere în sală. Dragii mei, sunteți într-una dintre marile universități ale României, în contact direct cu unul dintre marile spirite ale României. Vreau să aveți inspirația și inteligența să faceți din această zi, prima zi, înspre viitorul vostru. Nu în fiecare zi ai astfel de posibilități. Deschideți-vă larg antenele, pentru că într-o zi, unul dintre voi sper să meargă la Stockholm, unde a fost domnul profesor. Acum, după cum știți cu toții și Jean-Pierre Sauvage de asemenea știe acest lucru, România este cunoscută în lume și pentru gimnastele sale. Menirea gimnaștilor și menirea gimnastelor este să desăvârșească abilitățile muritorilor de rând, ca voi și ca mine, adăugându-ne adăugând nouă mișcări precise și pline de grație. Dumneavoastră, domnule profesor Sovaj, veți rămâne în istoria cu imarea științei de primul drept, primul savant, care a învățat moleculele să, să se deplaseze cu o precizie și perfecțiune la care acum câțiva ani nu puteam decât să visăm. Așa cum mașinile moleculare naturale lucrează în armonie de plină pentru a permite mușchilor, gimnaștilor și oamenilor să își miște întregul corp, și mașinile moleculare pe care le-ați creat au început să fie folosite de alți chimiști pentru a deplasa obiecte macroscopice și a valorifica noi proprietăți ale materii. Toate acestea datorită faptului că Jean-Pierre le-ai descoperit principiile de bază ne-ai deschis cu adevărat ochii către chimia viitorului. Putem așadar să spunem că profesorul Sovaj a adăugat o nouă dimensiune moleculelor. O nouă dimensiune moleculelor create de om. Le-a făcut să se miște după cum dorim noi. Dar înainte de a, de a le face să se miște, a trebuit să le facă. A trebuit să le sintetizeze. Iar în acest efort crucial de sinteză, a pus în aplicare, cât se poate de ingenios, principiile recunoașterii moleculare, astfel încât, dacă funcționează... A. Ia să vedem. Cum facem să funcționeze prezentarea?
Așa. Bun, toate se rezolvă cu cadru și liniște. Așadar, în efortul crucial de a sintetiza aceste molecule, a pus în aplicare cât se poate de ingenios principiile recunoașterii moleculare, astfel încât, așa cum vedeți pe ecran, a aranjat cu precizie blocuri de construcție moleculare, iar odată aranjate aceste blocuri, într-un mod corespunzător în spațiu, unul față de celălalt, a utilizat reacții chimice speciale pentru a le fixa, reușind ceea ce nimeni nu a reușit până atunci, și anume să interconecteze mecanic două sau mai multe molecule separate. Puteți vedea foarte bine pe ecran, iată, cum pentru prima dată două molecule separate au fost intercon interconectate mecanic. Acum, dacă una din aceste două molecule are mai multe stații, profesorul Sovaj a găsit modalitatea de a deplasa treptat o porțiune a unei molecule față de cealaltă. A sintetizat o serie de molecule care sunt interconectate, așa cum vedeți pe ecran, și așa cum spuneam, dacă una dintre ele are mai multe stații, de exemplu, această moleculă are mai multe stații, molecula roșie, a învățat molecula roșie să se miște de-a lungul acestor stații și de a deplasa treptat o porțiune a unei molecule față de cealaltă. Așadar, pentru prima dată, chimia din neprubetă a devenit dinamică. Domeniul pe care profesorul Sovaj l-a pus în lumină, cel al moleculelor interconectate, a ajuns astăzi la maturitate. Nu sunt puțini cei care susțin că a controla mișcarea moleculară, care acție la stimul chimic sau fizic, reprezintă nivelul cel mai înalt al controlului asupra materiei. Acest lucru este amplu demonstrat de numeroasele exemple care au urmat descoperirilor sale, care au început în 1983, și care au deschis calea unor noi direcții în cercetare în chimie, în fizică și în știința materialelor. A pus bazele dezvoltării unor mașini moleculare din ce în ce mai complexe, inclusiv comutatoare, matoare, motoare și pompe moleculare. Unii chiar au folosit motoarele moleculare pentru a obține mișcare macroscopică a semeni mușchilor. Jopier, nimeni nu ar fi surprins dacă cercetarea pe care ați făcut-o ar conduce la crearea unor noi tip de materiale, de polimeri, care se repară singuri sau materiale inteligente capabile să reacționeze la schimbările din mediu. Profesorul Sovaj a inspirat noi abordări de eliberare a medicamentelor și de detectare moleculară în organism, care ar putea să aibă implicații foarte importante în domeniul asistenței medicale și al cercetării biomedicale. Cine îl cunoaște pe Jean-Pierre Sovaj știe un lucru esențial, anume acela că Profesorul Sovaj prețuiește cel mai mult nu premiile pe care le-a primit, ci satisfacția. Cunoașterea care a venit din partea colegilor săi și premiul Nobel este doar unul dintre premiile obținute în 2016, împreună cu bunii săi prieteni Ben Feringa, și Fraser Stoddard, deci premiul Nobel a fost cea mai importantă distinție care i s-a oferit, însă bucuria de a vedea sintetizată în neprubetă molecula pe care și-a imaginat-o este în ochii săi răsplata supremă. Personalitatea solară a profesorului Sovaj este cea care luminează premiile pe care le primește și premiile pe care le-a primit nu i-au schimbat personalitatea. Aș spune, dragi tineri, că ceea ce eu am învățat de la profesorul Sovaj a fost că pentru el, și asta poate deveni și pentru voi, excelența să fie o stare firească, firescul excelenței. Iar acesta este, aș putea spune, semnul său distinctiv. Astăzi sărbătorim știința, sărbătorim chimia, sărbătorim excelența în chimie și știință. Mai presus de toate, sărbătorim astăzi personalitatea unică a lui Jean-Pierre Sauvage. Făcând acest lucru și legându-mă în continuare de această idee fundamentală de filiație academică, cred că trebuie să sărbătorim începuturile sale în renumita școală de chimie de la Strasburg și în marea familie a chimiștilor din Strasburg, unde Jean-Pierre Sauvage a, a fost student doar pentru a deveni mai târziu unul dintre cei mai proeminenți membri ai acestei comunități științifice a chimiștilor din Strasburg. A fost alături 
de chimiști care ne-au schimbat modul de înțelegere a acestei faimoase științe, începând cu Guy Orison, continuând cu Jean-Marie Lenn, conducătorul tezei sale de doctorat și prietenul său apropiat, ei au transformat împreună cu Jean-Pierre orașul Strasbourg într-un dintre marile centre de cercetare chimică de elită din lume. Dragi tineri, băieții mâna sus! Dragi băieți, cu toții ați visat la prințese. Adevărat? A, încă visați! Dragii mei, uite aici văd, văd un tânăr care chiar a îmbrățișat o prințesă, bravo! Dragii mei, unul dintre modurile de a avea la braț o prințesă este să iei premiul Nobel. Iată-l pe Jean-Pierre Sauvage cu prințesa Victoria a Suediei, dacă nu mă înșel. Vedeți că este foarte mândru în această poză. Poate peste ani, când prințesa va deveni regină, unul dintre voi îi va lua locul în, la brațul acestei prințese. O anume trăsătură îl deosebește pe Jean-Pierre Sauvage de alți laureați ai premiului Nobel. Atunci când primești premiul, trebuie să scrii o autobiografie. Și de obicei fiecare scrie acolo cât a fost el de grozav și e așa un exercițiu de auto-laudatio. E bine, ilustrând personalitatea sa cu adevărat generoasă, autobiografia lui Jean-Pierre Sauvage vorbește, și o puteți găsi pe site-ul premiului Nobel, despre oamenii care au contează și care au contat în viața lui, mai mult decât despre el însuși. Dacă citiți printre rânduri, această autobiografie, veți vedea că iese la lumină înclinația sa naturală de a dărui mai mult decât a primit. Și lucrul ăsta este foarte bine ilustrat prin modul în care a colaborat cu mari oameni de știință din lume. Să știți că competiția în lumea științei este acerbă, concurența este acerbă, dar Jean-Pierre a reușit să-și facă prieteni chiar și pe cei mai înverșunați concurenții ai săi. Și împreună au lucrat pentru progresul științei. Eu, ca mulți alții, m-am bucurat de generozitatea sa autentică, în circunstanțe care sunt prea emoționale pentru mine să le descriu în fața unui public atât de larg, dar caracteristica principală de a oferi mai mult decât de a primi este, cred, un lucru care trebuie să ghideze orice profesor, fie că este în zona preuniversitară sau în zona universitară. Jean-Pierre Sauvage s-a născut în octombrie 1944 la Paris și, așa cum se spune anterior, viața lui a fost mișcată de mișcare. Iată, a fost caracterizată de mișcare. Iată aici, în centru imaginii, îl vedeți în Tunisia. Iată-l aici, cu cămile, cu în, probabil, vreun deșert pe acolo. După care, iată în Statele Unite, mirat ieșind de la un film și mai târziu, cu Carmen, soția, la ceremonia de la căsătorie și nouă ne pare foarte rău că, din păcate, de, de această dată, Carmen uh, nu a putut să fie cu noi. A schimbat... aceste schimbări pentru el. Acum, s-a spus că și-a făcut doctoratul cu un alt laureat Nobel, ceea ce, iată-l aici, tânăr doctorand, împreună cu conducătorul său de doctorat, Jean-Marie Lenn, și ceea ce nu s-a spus este că el este cel care a sintetizat acești compuși pentru care Profesorul Len a luat premiul Nobel în 1987, deci Jean-Pierre Sauvage, în realitate, are un premiu Nobel și jumătate. După ce și-a terminat doctoratul la Strasbourg, a mers la Oxford și a lucrat cu mari cercetători, după care la Strasbourg și-a înființat propriul grup de cercetare. Așa cum se spunea, A, așa, păi chimia n-a, păi cea mai bună chimie. Așa, um, 
a lucrat foarte devreme, încă din anii 70, vă mulțumesc, a lucrat foarte devreme în sisteme care puteau să catalizeze descompunerea apei și un domeniu care încă este de mare actualitate și unde se pot face încă foarte mari progres. Acum, când se întâmplă să fiu în aceeași cameră, cu, în aceeași încăpere cu Jean-Pierre Sauvage, simțim amândoi nevoia să aducem un omagiu distins dragii noastre colegi Cristian Dietrich, un om minunat, un mare chimist, a cărei contribuție la producția științifică a grupului de cercetare a lui Jean-Pierre Sauvage s-a dovedit a fi hotărătoare. Domeniul topologiei chimice al moleculelor interconectate îi datorează cele mai călduroase mulțumiri. Mulțumindu-i lui Jean-Pierre că ne-a deschis ochii la știința pe care a dezvoltat-o, trebuie să mulțumim și soției sale, Carmen, o personalitate pe care, dacă ați cunoaște-o, ar ilumina această cameră mai puternic decât luminile puse aici de uh, fotografi. Iar prezența lui Carmen alături de Jean-Pierre a fost întotdeauna, înțeleg, o mare inspirație pentru el și o sursă constantă de energie pentru noi toți care o cunoaștem. Sunt foarte multe de spus despre chimia profesorului Sovaj, despre personalitatea sa și despre ceea ce el continuă să dea comunității, comunității științifice. Cu toate astea o să-i imit mentalitatea și voi ilustra ideea sa generoasă a unei comunități științifice vibrante prin trei fotografii, făcute la distanță de 30 de ani una de alta. Prima, aici, este în comunitatea, este din 1988, este în comunitatea de chimiști din Strasburg, vedeți aici un celebru anfiteatru al chimiei din Strasburg, unde s-au dezvoltat foarte multe elemente ale chimiei pe care o învățați la școală, când era celebrat premiul Nobel al profesorului Len, iată-l pe Jean-Pierre, alături de dragi prieteni Bernard Dietrich, Guy Orison și alți mari chimiști ai lumii. Următoarea fotografie este după 30 de ani, când el însuși a primit premiul Nobel. Și, în sfârșit, a treia fotografie este un omagiu adus celor care, din păcate, nu mai sunt printre noi și care au contribuit semnificativ la, tot, la toată știința profesorului Len și a profesorului Sovaj. Și pentru că am început să fac o paralelă între sublima mișcare a gimnastelor, Nadia Comăneci fiind cea mai celebră dintre gimnaste și dintre gimnaști, o să vă spun un mic secret, o mică istorioară care nu era în script. Am sunat-o acum ceva, câteva zile pe doamna Comăneci, pe Nadia Comăneci și am spus, uite, avem aici la Universitatea de Vest un laureat Nobel care a învățat moleculele să se miște. Și i-am povestit puțin despre profesorul Sovaj, despre faptul că cu siguranță știe despre ea, și Nadia, doamna Comăneci, mi-a trimis o poză cu o dedicație pentru Carmen și pentru Jean-Pierre Sauvaj, care spune, cu cald de salutări pentru Carmen și Jean-Pierre Sauvaj, pentru performanțele sale chimice, a făcut moleculele să se miște într-o manieră tot atât de frumoasă, precum noi, gimnaștii, reușim să o facem. Nadia Comăneci. N-am terminat, dar acuși. Dragă Jean-Pierre, datorită ție, astăzi sărbătorim chimia, sărbătorim știința, sărbătorim Timișoara și cultura ei, sărbătorim Universitatea de Vest, sărbătorim o Europa unită și, cel mai important, așteptăm cu nerăbdare împlinirea destinului nostru comun. Mulțumim, Jean-Pierre, 
Domnule profesor Sovaj, că sunteți alături de noi astăzi. Mai am un lucru care nu era în script. În 1986, când aveam 15 ani, domnul profesor Sovaj, prin circunstanțe care astăzi sunt greu de înțeles, mi-a trimis, ceea ce nu era posibil să primești în România acelor ani, o carte de chimie. Aveam 16 ani atunci, 15 ani, Structural Methods in Inorganic Chemistry. Asta este cartea care are ștampila laboratorului său. Și pentru că tot vorbim de filiație, eu aș vrea astăzi să dau mai departe această carte unui, unei cercetătoare care, cred, reprezintă viitorul științei chimice în România. Niculina? Știința operează și cu simboluri. Vă mulțumesc! Comisia de evaluare și de elaborare a laudației a fost alcătuită din președinte, profesorul dr. Marilen Gabriel Pirtea, rectorul Universității de Vezi din Timișoara, și a avut ca membri pe profesorul universitar dr. Anton Trăilescu, președintele Senatului UVT, Excelența sa ambasador Laurent Sauer, ambasada Franței în România, academician profesor Dr. 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 Honoris Cauza Marius Andruh, membru corespondent al Academiei Române, îi mulțumim pentru prezență, domnului conferențian Dr. Dr. Florin Drăgan, rectorul Universității Politehnica din Timișoara, profesor Dr. Dr. Inginer Adrian Curaj, directorul Unității Executive pentru Finanțarea Învățământului Superior al CGT Rezultării și Inovării, Profesorul Dr. Dr. José Antonio Maioral Murillo, directorul Universității din Zaragoza. Profesorul Dr. Dr. Filip Galez, rectorul Universității Savoie Mont Blanc. Profesorul Dr. Dr. Cezar Ionus Spânu, rectorul Universității din Craiova. Conferențiar Dr. Dr. Mădălin Bunoiu, prorector al Universității de Vest din Timișoara. Profesorul Dr. Dr. Inginer Mihai Puț, Universitatea de Vest din Timișoara. Și ultimul, dar nu neapărat cel din urmă, Dr. Daniel Funeriu, Universitatea din București. Și am aflat că domnul Andruh, o să ne upgradăm programul, este membru cu drepturi de plină, da, titular al Academiei Române. Este adevărat, domnule profesor? Bun. 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 Ok. Ne upgradăm și noi în mod transparent. Întotdeauna insist ca evenimentele și ceremoniile pe care am onoarea și deosebitul privilegiu de a le comisionat ale modera, să meargă și la inimile și la sufletele celor prezenți, să nu fie doar strict tehnice, cum se mai întâmplă la unele universități din lume. Am avut și eu șansa să văd zeci de asemenea evenimente. Și de aceea am să insist asupra faptului că personajele excepționale pe care le vedeți, cu statură de staruri rock și de vedete hollywoodiene, de fapt, sunt niște oameni în carne și oase care muncesc excepțional, care au calități deosebite și care confundă bucuria cu propria viață și cu vocația și cu talentul. O anecdotă tare frumoasă cu Robert Koch spune că odată venise o comisie întreagă de cercetători să-l viziteze în laboratorul unde știți bine câte a descoperit și le-a zis, ghiciți ce preparat fac acum. Și era o tăviță așa cu o flacră de sub și Sigur, aveți niște plachete acolo la... Na, na, na. Atunci niște bacil, că doar dumneavoastră le-ați dat numele, bacilul Coș, știți că bacil înseamnă bastonaș. Deci el cu forma te descurcat. Cine nu avea bacil în latin era imbecilum, era cu probleme mari, sper că nu e aluzie la cine nu știe chimie. Da? Deci imbecilitatea însemna lipsă de bastonaș, adică nu te poți deplasa singur. Atunci, poate niște streptococi? Na, 
no, departe. Și s-a întors radind. Viurșe, niște cârnăciori. Viața se desfășura în laborator, bucuriile erau toate acolo, hrana și întreaga existență se confundă. Și nu există o limită de vârstă sau de uh, uzură în acest domeniu. Chemat la un mare dineu din uh, Hollywood, Werner Heisenberg, pe atunci președinte la Max Planck și el cu preocupări de fizică, bineînțeles, majore și chimie, și n-a fost recunoscut de gazda de 21 de ani, una din moștenitoarele Rothschild, cine este, și l-a întrebat noastră cu ce vă ocupați, că nu prea vă știu din reviste. Deci, în contextul acesta, surâsul și bucuria sunt una, însă ceremonia noastră este alta, așa că am să vă rog să vă ridicați cu respectul pentru oaspetele nostru în picioare, nu pentru altceva, pentru că purcedem la momentul oficial, aproape sacramental, al întâlnirii noastre, ceremonia de de cernare a titlului de doctor honoris causa scientiarum domnului Jean-Pierre Sovaj. Universitas Occidentalis Timisiensis, Senatus Huius Universitatis, nos rector, omnes noscri comunitatem universitates nostri occidentalis Timisiensis dirigimus, inquirentes omnia que scripta et inquisita sunt a domino Jean-Pierre Sovaj, cogitationes ad potentias vires crementis humane probandum, in arcanas mundi illuminando, et videntes nos beneficia alata alme nostre matri universitati, cum consensione et caritate a sua diligentia, in nomine omnium collegarum, dominus Jean-Pierre Sauvage, declaratur doctor honoris causa scientiarum, ad maiorem suam gloriam et in signo considerationis nostre. Omnia hec firmamus sigilo rectorali et signationibus sequentibus. Rector, profesor universitarius Dr. Marilen Gabriel Pirtea, prese Senatus Universitatis, profesor universitarius Dr. Anton Treilescu. Civitate Timisiensi, die duo de viginti, mense quinto, anno domini 2000 viginti et tertio. Așezați, mulțumim. Sărmanii membri pot să-și dea jos tot cele de pe cap. În poze arată foarte bine, dar nu e superb să le porți toată ziua. Nu vreau să mai lungesc ceremonia noastră, pentru că știm cu toții așteptăm un discurs de primire, acum care și roba noastră, a primit și diplomă de la noi și este membru al comunității Universității de Vest. Profesorul Jean-Pierre Sovaj ne va încânta cu ceea ce știe el mai bine. Am să revin doar la un amănunt asupra căruia am promis că, că revin. Este o fotografie tare interesantă, 
din 1951, pe care ați văzut-o și în proiecția domnului profesor Daniel, funeriu, cu el și familia ieșind de la un film în St. Louis. Se văd fragmente de nume acolo și el spunea că e semnificativ pentru starurile de atunci de la Hollywood. Chimie, nu sunt specialist, dar istoria cinematografiei mondiale o predau. Este un film din 1951 cu Frank Sinatra, superstar, cu Jane Russell, care este partenera lui Marilyn Monroe în Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, și cu unul cei mai mari comici american, Groucho Marx. Un film nu de mare calitate, dar al cărui titlu mie mi se pare perfect premonitoriu. Nu cred în coincidențe. Sincer. Filmul se numește și nu era singurul francez implicat. În distribuție era și un Jean de Briac, care va juca și în clasa Blanca, deci un francez mic în Filmul se numește Double Dynamite, dinamită dublă. Ce o fi inventat Nobel de a înființa premiul care poartă numele ca să în ghilimele spun unii ca să spele păcatele? Dinamita. Și vreau să spun că dinamita dublă poate fi a celor doi colegi de la Strasbourg. Jean-Marie Len și Jean-Pierre Sauvage, poate fi a lui Nobel însuși și a succesorului său și poate fi a profesorului Sovaj, cum ne menea domnul Funeriu și a unuia din această sală. Cu aceasta, ceremonia noastră are o mică pauză, un, z- un răgaz, în care trebuie să reorganizăm sala în trei minute. Și, după aceea, okay. și în, înainte acelui moment, discursul de primire a acestui onorant titlu. Domnule profesor. So do you hear me? Okay, good. So I must say I'm really moved, you know, by um, what the, some of the people said. And um, of course, the, the speeches uh, brought me back to my past, you know, to my young uh, years. Um, so it was really moving. <coughs> So let me say that um, first, I'm of course very happy to be here. I also regret that my wife couldn't come, uh, but we have been traveling so much since um, the, the Nobel Prize that she's completely exhausted and she wants to stay at home um, as much as she can. So we have to forgive her, I think. So first of all, I'd like to very warmly thank the University of Timisoara and uh, its president, Professor Marilyn Gabrielle Pieter, uh, for awarding me the title of uh, Dr. Honoris Causa Scientiarum. Um, I never studied Latin, so I have to apologize. My pronunciation is probably not so good. Um, It's a great honor that uh, makes me feel very happy, uh, very proud, and also very grateful uh, to this university. Um, I have met uh, many Romanian scientists in the past, in the many meetings I participated in, um, but I'm very sorry that I never had Romanian uh, PhD students nor postdocs And I'm afraid that nowadays it's a little bit too late. You know, but, uh, 
so I met Professor Daniel Funerio many years ago. Um, more than that, as it has already been mentioned, I met his father, Lionel, uh, more than 35 years ago, if I count correctly, when Daniel was still a teenager with uh, a great passion for chemistry, and we were able to arrange for Daniel to get some uh, chemistry books that were probably more difficult to obtain uh, in Central Europe. Let me tell my research team members uh, that it was wonderful for my uh, members, for my team members, it was wonderful to be able to help a young scientist uh, full of passion and also uh, we didn't know, but with a very bright future, but that's something of course we didn't know. And my group was very happy. You know, some of them uh, contributed by offering a book to Daniel, especially an American postdoc. Uh, so that was great. We were all very, very satisfied. I'm particularly, particularly happy that your university uh, created its Faculty of Chemistry, Biology, and Geography in 1991. Uh, just after the events of uh, 1989. Um, it shows that uh, the promotion of science, which is so important, um, uh, started also uh, in this place, or let's say continued. And um, I must say that um, under the effect of a great number of factors, um, our time is the scene of a strong and dangerous criticism of science. And this is something which hurts me, which shocks me, uh, like uh, many of us, I'm sure. Various factors can be invoked to explain uh, this dangerous uh, tendency, uh, among which conspiracy, ignorance, and laziness, because we scientists I think we have to react and to oppose uh, to this uh, general trend of some, some people. It is thus essential that individuals and organizations like um, your university uh, be active and demonstrate that anti-science actions are toxic, dangerous. Among the various uh, scientific uh, subjects essential uh, to progress, chemistry as a science or as an industry is perhaps even more incrimi incriminated. Uh, this is particularly unfair if you consider uh, the importance of chemistry as a science, but also the importance of uh, the industry related to chemistry. I would like to say that chemistry is a beautiful science because it produces beautiful objects which very often can be considered as pieces of art. One of the most important areas of molecular sciences is synthesis. Chemists are now able to make molecules of truly impressive complexity that can be found um, in many, many um, important applications, especially in medicine, in, in uh, pharmacy. And uh, this is, of course, extremely important for the future, uh, the future of medicine. As an early stage, we were able to fabricate complex molecular systems, uh, such as interlocking rings, and this has been uh, very beautifully uh, described uh, by Daniel in particular. Um, this field led to um, molecular machines and molecular molecular motors and machines were built much, much before 
those made by chemists a few billion years before. I would also like to, to conclude by saying that molecular chemists create new objects um, that sometimes are considered as uh, works of art, and this is something I already mentioned. It is so important that I insist on that. Most of them didn't exist before uh, they were made by um, experimentalists, uh, but the specificity uh, gives the chemist a particular role, um, even a unique power, the synthesis of these complex molecules, such as molecular motors, requires a high level of expertise and um, a great skill. It is obviously the result of a teamwork, and I would like to insist on that. The teamwork involves professional researchers and professors, um, postdoctoral fellows and PhD students. And this is one of the French specificities because we have the research agency, uh, CNRS, Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, which helps enormously uh, our research by, by paying full-time researchers. And in our laboratories, we have teams uh, consisting of several professional researchers, very often working together. And in my group, the contribution of these people were absolutely um, essential. Um, and this is also due to the fact that if you can manage in your group to have very friendly relationship uh, between all the members, um, it is very, very good for your research. So with that, again, a big thank you to your university, a big thank you uh, to the Hector, to Daniel, and to the other uh, members of this assembly. Uh, a big thank you to the public. Uh, you seem to, to listen very carefully. So I will stop at this stage. Thank you. Ceremonia noastră, așa cum ziceam, va lua o mică pauză. Este uh, terminată doar partea ei uh, științifică urmează. Este terminată doar partea de, de cernare a tilului de lucru. Să ascultați, se învață cât dintr-o sută de cărți. Pentru că e sinteza unei întregi vieți și unei activități excepționale. Vă rugăm să nu părăsiți sala și uh, continuăm după trei minute. Vă mulțumim! Cine părăsește sala rămâne corigent la chimie. O să am personal grijă de chestia asta.
Ce să punem o masă, dar eu știu ce masă. Poate nu o pune. Luați loc, vă rog, începem conferința. Se vede bine pe ecran, tehnica funcționează. Poate putem stinge puțin lumina aici în față, să se vadă mai bine. So, shall I start my lecture? Yes? So, we are going to talk about molecular machines, which is not a great surprise, I'm sure, for you. Uh, molecular machines in biology and in chemistry. And, uh, of course, you should know there is no competition between biology and chemistry. Uh, this will very clearly demonstrate that we are far behind biology, uh, but there is a step forward towards biological systems. So, I'm sure that there are people uh, who are quite far away from chemistry, molecular chemistry, and I will just start with a very short introduction. The short introduction um, um, relies to uh, very simple molecules, and I drew here uh, a molecule of benzene. So everybody heard of benzene. Uh, benzene is a uh, six-membered ring, and you have six carbon atoms. And if you are not a chemist, most of the time you draw benzene like this, with carbon atoms connected by double bonds, single bonds, double bonds, etc. But this is very complicated. It will take time if you want to draw it. And everybody agrees nowadays among chemists that this is the best way to represent benzene. And you can notice one thing which is very important. We do not indicate carbon atom here. They are simply the vertices of the hexagon. The same is true for another very simple molecule. So now, when you will see molecules, you have to keep in mind that uh, if there is some kind of complicated figure, and uh, the, the carbon atoms are not indicated as a C, but they are simply um, the vertices uh, of, the, of the figure. So this being said, I will start with a... Um, Simple molecule, but it was a complete surprise when the people could make it. So, fullerene contains 60 carbon atoms, um, and this is basically a nano uh, a soccer, soccer ball, you know, football ball or soccer ball. And this soccer ball, uh, here you have uh, 60. Um, vertices, again, 
Uh, and so this is now the chemical representation. And if you look, it's a nanosphere, you know, something uh, really very tiny, uh, which was isolated and prepared completely by accident. The people were uh, looking for molecules in interstellar space. Probably you know that in interstellar space, you have billions and billions and billions of molecules. Uh, we think of interstellar space as a vacuum, but this is completely wrong. You have lots and lots of molecules. And so the people were trying to um, make molecules which could be um, interstellar molecules. But it failed completely. And the beauty is that they discovered this new molecule, C60. And that was, to, to a large extent, a uh, revolution uh, because the chemists uh, never thought that C60 could exist, uh, could be made. It was a very simple um, synthesis. It was a one-step synthesis, a very powerful laser on graphite. That was it. And here, uh, underlined in, in yellow, uh, it says serendipity. And I will come back to that. But serendipity, which is discovery by accident, is very important. So there are many, many discoveries, even Nobel Prize discoveries, uh, which are due to serendipity, you know, happy accident. Now, let me talk about the molecules uh, which have been working on for uh, decades and decades, catenanes and rotaxanes. So catenanes are interlocking rings, and the simplest catenane is a two catenane, two because you have two interlocking rings. Rotaxanes are species of this type. Uh, they are, of course, uh, related to catenanes, uh, but I will mostly focus on, on catenanes. So catenanes have been uh, um, very important in the past in terms of discussion. And uh, it has been shown that uh, in 1915 or so, uh, there were already discussions in Switzerland, in particular in Zurich, uh, to know whether catenanes could exist, whether we could, whether we could make one day uh, catenanes, uh, but nothing really happened in terms of experimental work. Uh, catenanes um, were made in a fully convincing and um, somewhat satisfactory uh, fashion. fashion. Uh, the work was published in 1964, so many, many years ago. Uh, it was done by Professor Schill and Professor Lüttringhaus, uh, two legendary uh, organic chemists uh, based in uh, Freiburg in Germany. Uh, so beautiful work, and I, I was too young, actually. I was not a chemist at the time. I was still a, um, a student, a young student. And um, I, I believe that uh, the community uh, greeted the work because it was really spectacular. Uh, and so that was clearly the first demonstration that catenanes can be made. The weak point was that it was a 23 individual chemical steps uh, synthesis, which means that uh, if you want to repeat the work, uh, it's going to take a lot of time and you will have really difficulty. And this is the reason why uh, the field uh, became kind of uh, dormant for um, many years, for almost 20 years, and nobody was interested in catenines anymore. Now I will explain you how we started in this field. As um, it has been already mentioned, uh, when I was a, let's say, uh, between um, assistant and associate uh, CNRS uh, professor, um, coming back from my postdoctoral stay in the UK, uh, with uh, Jean-Marie Lane, we started a project. It was a project uh, trying to 
split the water molecule to H2 and O2. So very, very ambitious, uh, using solar laws. It was just after the first energy crisis, uh, which took place in 73, 74, Everybody knows H2 would be the ideal fuel because when you burn it, you just produce water. And at the time, <coughs> the hero was ruthenium 3 by pyridine, this molecule. And things haven't changed so much because a lot of people are still using ruthenium 3 by pyridine, this compound, relatively simple compound. Uh, you have three organic fragments, which are called ligands, in uh, inorganic chemistry, and a ruthenium center. And this molecule has uh, really fantastic properties because if you shine light on it, using solar light, let's say, you generate what is called a photo-excited state. So you introduce a lot of energy in the molecule, and this photo-excited state is at the same time a very strong electron donor and a very strong electron acceptor. So this is kind of uh, surprising, but it's true, believe me. Which means that the excited state, thermodynamically speaking, should be able to oxidize water to O2 and reduce water to H2. So hundreds and hundreds of laboratories have worked on this molecule trying to split the water molecule. It didn't work so well, uh, but anyway, there was a weak point. <coughs> the weak point is that at the center of the molecule, you have a ruthenium atom. And the ruthenium metal, I'm sorry, I have to drink. Very sorry. So ruthenium is a noble metal, which means that it is very expensive, uh, similar to gold or platinum. And um, <coughs> we thought, and some other people thought the same, that it would be advantageous to replace it by something much less expensive like copper. And Professor Macmillan and his group in the US had already started on the problem, can we replace ruthenium for copper? And the answer was yes, to a large extent. And so Dave Macmillan, whom I knew already before, uh, decided to spend his sabbatical leave in Strasbourg and uh, when he arrived, of course, we immediately had a lot of interaction. And we had made a molecule, a simple molecule like this, like a crescent. Uh, and this molecule uh, was new, very surprisingly, but it had never been made by other uh, chemists. And so when he saw the molecule in our group, he said, well, we, we must collaborate. Uh, you will add copper, a copper salt, to it, and you will make this complex. And this is something we did, very, very simple. It's a five-minute uh, uh, experiment. You just mix. It's quantitative, and you obtain a deep red complex of, between red and purple. And this molecule turned out to have very interesting uh, photochemical properties, similar to those of ruthenium trisbarpyridine. So that was very good news. But there was something else. And I will show you the something else. Now we will materialize the two endpoints of this part, this component. 
And we will now go on and materialize the end, end points of the other components. So we have two blue points belonging to this fragment and two red points belonging to the other fragment. I was in charge of drawing the molecules at the time, which probably was important because when you have to draw your molecules, uh, you sweat, you know, you suffer. Uh, it's a difficult process, but at least you digest the shape of the molecule. The shape of the molecule, you know, you, you digest it. And so uh, I noticed that if you interconnect the two blue points and separately the two red points, you make a catenane. Of course, this is uh, a chemistry on the paper or on the board. Uh, it had to be done. And uh, in my group, there were lots of discussions because some people thought that, you know, we shouldn't touch um, those exotic molecules such as catenanes and stick with what we knew, which was catalysis, inorganic chemistry, um, inorganic photochemistry. But finally, we decided to jump in a new field. And the new field uh, is um, that of catenanes. And we could show that uh, starting from uh, um, such a, a compound, you can um, make a copper complex, as I said before. And now we will cyclize on the right and on the left, and you have your catenane. Very, very simple on paper. And so we also developed a more elaborated uh, strategy, which was starting from a ring here, uh, let's say a prefabricated ring, and now we will thread the ring by copper and another fragment, and finally cyclize. And this is the second strategy uh, which we have been using uh, extensively. So, as uh, Daniel showed, uh, we published uh, rapidly our uh, data. Uh, Christian Dietrich Buschecker was a fantastic organic chemist. She was also a very close friend. And um, within a couple of months, she could make uh, grams of uh, catenanes. And we published in Tetrahedron Letters, uh, which is not a high impact journal. But at the time, we didn't know what high impact journal means. You know, we didn't care, actually. And we published in French. That was more or less to pay homage to my former boss and very close friend, Jean-Marie Lane, because our two first papers on cryptates that uh, were shown by Daniel were all I have X-ray structures of the two compounds, the one still containing copper, and the other one, which is the, the metal-free species. And if you look at the structures, you know, it's really like a 3D picture of the molecule, you see that those two pictures are very different. The shape of this guy here, the metal-free species, is very different from that of the copper complex, which is very, very compact. And so this is, of course, not a molecular machine, but this is underway. Uh, towards um, high amplitude motions. Now, let me pay homage to the people who has, have been working on catenanes. Uh, <coughs> I'm not going to read the long list here, but everything started uh, basically with a um, publication on theory. It was uh, the theory of uh, molecular topology because this is related to topology, and molecular topology, and they tried to make a, a catenane, but uh, it was not fully convincing. I already mentioned Schill, uh, who published his first paper in 64, but again, exceedingly difficult to, um, to repeat, and um, so it was a brilliant idea, but very let's say, with a limited um, uh, influence. Uh, and our team published the, the work in 1983, so 40 years ago, 
And from that moment, several people uh, embarked you know, in this new field. Uh, Fraser Stoddart in 89 and all these people. And if you look nowadays, um, there are many, many people, uh, many groups um, interested in uh, catenanes and, and nuts also. So just in passing, you know, we have been interested in more complex topologies. Uh, these molecules have an interesting topology, meaning that if you draw them on a sheet of paper, uh, you will have to introduce crossing points. There is no way you can draw a trifle knot or a two catenane on your sheet of paper with, without crossing points. And this implies that the topology of this species is non-trivial, but we are very far away from uh, mathematical uh, topology. So just a little bit of uh, knot theory, uh, which is part of uh, low dimensional topology. It's a big branch of topology in mathematics. Um, there are prime knots here. I have a, a, a list or a table of um, um, prime knots. So the simplest <coughs> prime knots is this one, the trifle knot, and uh, maybe 10 years after the catenane, uh, we, we could make a, a trifle knot with a molecule, and uh, we studied that. We spent a lot of time on that, and it was, of course, uh, very exciting for the people who were doing the work. Uh, three means you have three crossings if you want to draw it in a plane. This one is probably the record. It has been made by the group of David Lee in the UK, in uh, Manchester, uh, three years ago. Uh, seven crossings, and this is called the endless knot, uh, probably the record. So let me now show you that uh, catenanes and knots are very common in biology, incredibly common. Um, DNA, in particular, or circular duplex DNA, forms uh, uh, catenanes, form uh, knotty structures, and here we have a few electron micrographs showing uh, so the trifle knot here, um, another uh, catenane, it's a complex catenane, the figure eight catenane, with five crossings, um, etc. So this is another view of the trifle knot. Um, really a beautiful structure, and the, the, the five-crossing five uh, catenane, which is also called the whitehead link, uh, because of an English uh, mathematician, uh, Dr. Whitehead, who was very much interested in these species um, in the 1930s or 40s. The record in terms of catenanes, with no doubt, that of uh, virus, HK97. HK97 is not dangerous, you know. Uh, bacteriophage uh, doesn't care about mammals. Uh, it invades bacteria <coughs> to mix its DNA with that of the bacterium. Uh, it's a DNA uh, virus, not RNA. And if you look at the, the envelope uh, of this uh, virus, which is the capsid, called the capsid, uh, you can see clearly that you have hexagons and pentagons of proteins, and those pentagons and hexagons are interlocking with one another so that you obtain something which is uh, similar to a chain mail. Uh, in French, we say Côte de Maille. Um, and a, a, a chain mail is something which is very robust. You cannot break it easily. Um, and at the same time, you can move uh, almost freely. And this is why these viruses can pass barriers uh, and invade bacteria very easily. Now let's move on and talk about molecular machines. So two statements. The first one is that chemists made millions of molecules, of new molecules, using synthesis. But most of them, 99.99% or so, 
can be considered as static. And even if they move, they can, of course, distort, elongate. Uh, they can do lots of things. Um, we have no control over their motions. So they are perhaps dynamic species, but uh, we have no control. So everybody would say that they are static or simply they undergo stochastic uh, motion. Biology, you now, if you look at biology, uh, control motion is everywhere. So in particular, you have a family of, uh, of molecules, the motor proteins, uh, which are really motors. And uh, <coughs> in biology, control molecular motion is absolutely essential. And as we will see in a minute, uh, we have rotary motors, linear motors, uh, walkers, uh, systems able to contract or although it doesn't mean really anything, which is the most important enzyme, or one of the most important enzymes. Um, everything that um, lives on Earth is based on ATP synthase uh, because ATP is um, the, the fuel of life. Uh, you know that when we move, when we do whatever we, we have to do, uh, we consume energy, and consuming energy for living organisms means hydrolyzing ATP, or if you prefer, degrading ATP, to ADP. ATP is the triphosphate, and ADP is the diphosphate. So you have a hydrolysis, and this degrades ATP, the fuel, uh, and produces ADP. But nature is very, really uh, environmentally um, very clever, uh, because when we burn our fuel in a car or wherever, uh, we throw away water and CO2. And we know it's a big problem. But nature recycles everything. And so the, the degraded form of ATP, which is ADB, ADP, will be recycled in our body uh, so as to regenerate ATP. And probably you, you know that uh, you burn, uh, so to say, which means you hydrolyze um, roughly uh, one half of your weight every day. Does it speak to you? For me, it would be uh, something like 38 kilos of ATP every day. It's a lot. And you rebuild this ATP by uh, just um, taking ADP and reconstructing um, uh, ATP. So it's a rotary motor. It's a beautiful system. And uh, there is a nice drawing here, <coughs> which is um, uh, related to the work of um, these uh, Japanese uh, researchers, uh, Noji Kinoshita, was, I think it was the boss. And in 1997, <coughs> they could show that ATP synthase, uh, or ATPase, if you hydrolyze ATP, is a rotary motor. So you have a big uh, cluster of proteins here. You have the axis, so this will be the uh, the rotating axis, and they did something very clever. They immobilized this uh, enzyme, ATPase, on the surface, and they attached a very long filament, actin filament, uh, on the extremity of the rotor. And they could show that it rotates. So this is exactly what they did. If you look, sorry, if you look... Uh, if you look now <coughs> from above, so let's assume uh, you have a microscope, you know, looking. That ATP synthase or ATPase um, is a rotary motor, so a big thing. And there is another uh, video, a beautiful video now, uh, which is not at all science fiction because there were um, hundreds, if not thousands, of publications on uh, trying to understand the structure 
of this uh, enzyme. And so this is really something you can trust. Uh, you have a rotary motor. So this is more or less repeating what I said before. This is the axis. Uh, you have the cluster of proteins with a hollow part here. And uh, the axis is threaded inside the, uh, this part. And you can see ADP, which is yellow, and inorganic phosphate, uh, which come together, uh, insert themselves in this kind of pocket. Here, or there are six pockets. And uh, there is some chemical reaction taking place. And ATP um, is extruded, is expelled as the, the purple species. Another example, which uh, I think is particularly impressive, and that chemists could even mimic recently, is that of the kinesin. And kinesin is in the cell. It's a walker, because in the cell you have um, uh, factories, biosynthetic factories in, at some places, uh, so making, let's say, pieces of uh, uh, DNA or RNA, hormones, uh, pieces of proteins, all that. And all these fragments have to be um, <coughs> um, transported, to be carried uh, to some other places within the cell where they are expected to arrive. And so the kinesin works on microtubules, and this is a microtubule, it's a self-assembled a uh, long tube, you know, again, self-assembly and supramolecular chemistry, but in, in the biological world. And the kinesin, uh, oops, sorry. And the kinesin works, it's a relatively tiny species, you know, uh, maybe 30 nanometers long. And uh, it has been shown clearly that it can walk and carry, you know, the big bag when, uh, exactly like when you go to the supermarket and, you know, you buy everything and, uh, and so it bought everything and in there you have all the molecular fragments which have to be carried, you know, very far away from the factory. Now, molecular machines in chemistry. So we have seen uh, biology and there are many, many other examples but what about chemistry? And the first question you, you can address is why are cationanes and rotaxanes uh, so important, so interesting in relation to molecular machines? And clearly, molecular machines, it's a field uh, which comes from the work on cationanes. So pretty obvious, if you take uh, a rotaxane, a very simple rotaxane, like this one here. And if you are able to set the, the system in motion, uh, moving a ring from let's say, the left side um, to the, no, the right side to the left side, uh, you are close to making a, um, a linear motor, like a piston moving in a cylinder. Here, I'm sorry, <coughs> here, you are um, functionality. So at the beginning, the people were interested in oscillating uh, machines or pirouetting machines. So now let me show you the, the very first uh, molecular motor or machine we made in Strasbourg. It's a pirouetting system. So this is the principle. I'm sorry, you know, it's a bit chemical, but I'm sure that um, you can understand. So now we will start from here, from this part. You can see that copper is smiley. So copper one, one plus, is very happy when it is surrounded by four nitrogen atoms. So copper one is, we say, coordinated to four nitrogen atoms arranged as a tetrahedron. Now we will oxidize copper one to copper two. So we abstract an electron 
we generate copper 2 plus. And no need to enter the details, but copper 2 plus hates to be surrounded by four nitrogen atoms only. It wants to be five coordinated, we say, or six coordinated, so that this species is very unstable. It's clear, look at the face of copper 2. And now what will go on is quite simple. The ring which is here, which can offer three nitrogen atoms to the copper, will rotate, will move, and we obtain something which is now very stable. So this fragment is expelled. It will lie at the periphery, at the outside now. And the, the five, uh, no, I'm sorry, the three nitrogen fragments I will uh, replace it and interact with copper. So you have one, two, three, four, five nitrogen atoms interacting with copper, two plus. And you can come back. Uh, so you will, uh, uh, <coughs> again, reduce copper two to copper one. Copper one will be very unhappy because it wants to be tetrahedrally coordinated. And the ring, again, will glide so as to regenerate the starting frog. Very, very simple, almost naive, but I think it was a clear demonstration that using some uh, electrochemical process, uh, you can trigger a very large amplitude motion. So we made a video, or Sylvest made a video, uh, copper one, we start, uh, we generate copper two, so the system rearranges, we reduce back copper two to copper one, Etc. So, very little to say, except, except that uh, the system is incredibly stable. Uh, of course, in the computer, I can do it uh, as long as I, as I wish, till it crashes. Uh, but uh, with the molecules, it is exactly the same. We never observed any degradation. <coughs> So another example, which is uh, due to the, the work of uh, um, Fraser Stoddart and um, two postdocs, Emilio Cordova and uh, Bissell, and uh, Professor Ankel Kiefer at the University of Florida in Miami. Uh, they made the molecular shuttle. A molecular shuttle is quite simple. Uh, you have a ring which, which can shuttle between two stations, let's say the airport here and the, the downtown area. And so uh, it worked beautifully. So they made this compound here. Uh, we have limited time, so I wouldn't like to discuss that in detail. Uh, but you have a blue ring, blue on the drawings, a blue ring here, uh, which is a very uh, electron deficient species which can move from the green station to the, uh, from the green station. It was that it was published in 1994, uh, exactly the same year as our cation. So that competition, in a way, uh, didn't exist because we were you can say deuce, you know, in sport. Um, and so the, the work of Fraser Stoddart and his group, um, also they, they took advantage of, of these systems and they made something really exciting. And they made a very long rotaxane. They attached this extremity to a nano electrode, uh, the other end to another nano electrode and they could trigger the motion uh, using this very uh, tiny electrochemical system. So you can move the ring um, from the green to the red and go back to the green by using electron transfer. Uh, you can measure uh, the conductivity here of this uh, wire uh, using um, very sophisticated techniques. And the conductivity will tell you whether the blue ring is sitting here or sitting here. And finally, you can erase. So you apply a strong potential, and everybody obeys and goes back to this position. So what you can do 
is that uh, write, read using conductivity, and erase. So you have something which is really very exciting. Uh, <coughs> it's a electronic memory um, uh, storage and, and processing uh, device. Um, but the weak point was that the molecules are too unstable. And if you can do that maybe 10 times or 50 times, um, after, let's say, 100 times, the system is dead. And if you want to replace our, you know, good, old good computers uh, by molecules, uh, you will have to improve the system enormously. You, can, you know, it will have to be recycled millions and millions of times. There is still work to be done. Let me spend a minute on the work of Ben Feringa and his group. And Ben Feringa, in 1999, uh, they published a revolutionary paper which was making a rotary motor. And the energy used to uh, set the system in motion was light. <coughs> so this is represented here, but I know it's not so easy to visualize for people who are not so familiar with molecules. Uh, what you have to know is here you have a double bond, a C-C double bond, and the C-C double bond is uh, light sensitive. If you shine light on it, UV light, you will force it to isomerize, to modify its shape. And so this is what they did. <coughs> if you shine light, UV light, to generate these species after the system has started to rotate, now you wait for some time, and that was serendipity. light energy again, so you shine light, UV light, and um, <coughs> you continue, the motion will continue, so you, it rotates, you are here, and now you heat a little bit, and you go back to the starting form. Yeah, sorry. <coughs> and so, uh, uh, they published a beautiful video on the internet, which is exactly what I described, and it's probably easier um, to, to visualize the process. So we have four signals, one which is thermal, the second photochemical, the third thermal, the fourth photochemical, etc. Thermal, it's very easy to recognize heating here. And when it is a photochemical step, you will see a big flash of light. So let's start. So it's a okay, flash of light, thermal, flash of light, thermal. And we are back at the starting point, and we can do that. So at the beginning, uh, in um, Ben Feringa's group, they were working in the, uh, in the range of um, hours. So the first system, I think, required something like uh, uh, six or seven hours to perform a complete um, um, round. And uh, <coughs> nowadays, they are in the microsecond or even some microsecond uh, time scale, which shows that uh, you, know, you can improve those systems in a very spectacular way. So let me talk about um, a system uh, which uh, we started to work on um, 20 years ago, a bit more than 20 years ago. Um, we were dreaming of artificial muscles at the nano scale, uh, a nano artificial muscle. And so the principle, well, it's more than the principle, um, the principle nevertheless is described here. Uh, you have a rotaxane dimer. So you see that you have a rotaxane here, a very simple rotaxane here, another very simple rotaxane here, and now you interconnect both and you obtain this dimer. So what you generate 
is something with two, um, two fragments which are able to glide along one another. And this is very similar to natural muscles. If you think of our muscles, or all the mammals' muscles, uh, you have filaments gliding along one another, actin and myosin, but we have no time to talk about that. Uh, and so this is what we uh, could clearly demonstrate. I must say that the chemistry is very complex, and it is uh, deliberately that I prefer not to show the, the complete molecular system but uh, it goes from 8 nanometers to 6 nanometers, and to a large extent, it inspired um, many groups uh, who are now working on um, artificial muscles and nanomuscles. Um, another system, uh, which is much more recent, is that of uh, molecular compressors. And we, are, we were inspired by, by biology, again, and in biology, you have uh, uh, chaperons, uh, chaperons which are use, huge enzymes with a hollow part. And uh, when proteins are denatured, you know, again, nature is very uh, ecological. When proteins are denatured, they are not thrown away. They are uh, cured, they are repaired. And so those huge containers uh, will incorporate encapsulate the denature proteins and um, the, the big uh, chaperon will do some kind of massage uh, on the protein and then the protein will be kicked out and go back to work. And so this is some kind of uh, a compressor. And just to show you very, very briefly, uh, we made a forhotaxane, uh, relatively <coughs> complex, uh, with two plates here. So these plates are porphyrins. So for chemists, I'm sure that they, they know what porphyrins are. Very stable, uh, square-like uh, plates. And uh, we can incorporate uh, guests or small molecules in between the two plates. And by um, sending a signal to the molecule, it's a chemical signal, we remove the copper ions and this forces the system to rearrange, and the two plates come to closer and closer and closer proximity. And so you compress the gas, and finally you will expel it. So let me finish up by uh, saying that uh, molecular machines um, have developed in a very spectacular fashion. Um, so here are a few examples. I'm oh, sorry. Here are a few examples, uh, but um, maybe I will uh, uh, focus on the most spectacular examples uh, which have been proposed by David Lee and his group. So David Lee is clearly one of the most uh, uh, productive group um, in, uh, in Manchester, in the UK. Uh, so they have made uh, uh, compressors, molecular pumps, uh, they have made something which is really impressive uh, in relation to the kinesin system, which I discussed. They made a system for which a molecule can walk uh, on, a, on a rail, and probably the most uh, uh, impressive system is that of uh, mimicking the ribosome, and you know that the ribosome is probably the most complex enzyme that we do not fully understand as yet. Uh, but the ribosome is able to make uh, proteins, so to assemble uh, amino acids in a very uh, precise way. Uh, and so they could show that using a very complex rotaxane, uh, they can assemble, um, they can make a small peptide in a fully controlled fashion. It's only the beginning, of course. I mean, it's a tri-peptide. Uh, but this is really spectacular. So let me finish up. Uh, so this is the second time I say finish up, I'm sorry. Uh, let me continue by saying that uh, what I spoke about is a team, it's a teamwork. Uh, and uh, so again, in the French system, 
there is something which is really nice, I believe. Uh, so the people with uh, bold letters uh, uh, have been, you know, uh, permanent members of our group. Uh, all of them were very good friends. Uh, and so they were um, really <coughs> the core of the group. They were supervising students or co-supervising students, co-supervising postdocs. And uh, so I would like to thank them very warmly. Um, also my thanks uh, will go to the PhD students and postdoc who participated in this work. Um, so this is more for the people uh, with uh, an orientation towards dynamic systems, molecular machines, molecular motors. The field was started by Aude Livray. <coughs> uh, and um, the muscle, uh, so that was the work of Christian Dietrich Buschecker and uh, Maria Consuelo Jimenez Cello, uh, who devoted two years uh, of her life working basically day and, and night on this project. And so all these people had a very important contribution. Uh, this is for the, the compressor. And uh, finally, I would like to thank my university, uh, the CNRS. I would like also to uh, thank um, Northwestern University where I spent three years commuting between Strasbourg and uh, Chicago, Evanston, um, after the CNRS had strongly suggested me to retire. And uh, also, I would like to thank uh, ISIS, uh, the institute I joined after this retirement, uh, my mentor and, and very close friend, Jean-Marie, uh, Malcolm Green, uh, with whom I learned uh, organometallic chemistry and a lot of inorganic chemistry. Uh, he passed away very sadly two or three years ago. Two teachers, my family, and uh, my two very good friends, Fraser Stoddart and Ben Feringa. If, uh, just three slides, if you agree, but I can skip that. Or <laughs> and uh, so this is December 10, 2016. Uh, just after the ceremony of uh, the, the Nobel Prize so with the king, the queen, and uh, you know, all the, um, the royal family. And um, so Fraser seems to be absent. I don't know why. Uh, but Fraser, but Ben and I are um, very happy. Uh, on the next slide, so the fourth member of the family, who was very familiar with Stockholm and the Nobel ceremony, Jean-Marie. And um, the reason why I show these pictures, is maybe you will find that uh, relatively funny, uh, but we met Fraser and I in 1979. We first met in 1979. And I don't know why, but from the beginning, we became very good, very good friends. You know? So we never, we tried to never be competitors. And we were even telling each other, you know, we are starting this project. We hope you are not working on the same project. And that was really great. And Ben, uh, I met him in 1988. He was also a good friend, not as close as Fraser Stoddart. Uh, with Fraser, our families knew each other very well. You know, we sent our kids to, uh, and to the Stoddart family when he was 18 or so in order for him to improve his English. And uh, Fraser and Norma, his wife, uh, sent her daughter to France to spend a month in our family uh, to improve her French. But that was a disaster. You know? <laughs> because, you know, she was, we could speak English, of course. She was very happy to speak English. And she was spending her time telling us, don't tell dad, don't tell my dad, you know. That. <laughs> And uh, this is uh, after the ceremony with uh, my family, our son, uh, our son and his wife, and Anneli uh, was um, the lady who was uh, with us for 10 days or 12 days 
uh, guiding us and guiding me, you know, uh, telling me, Jean-Pierre, now you have to go to this place, now you will visit this high school, I will wait for you, and etc. So she was extremely useful, of course, and I think if she had not been helping us, I would still be in Stockholm, you know, looking for my way. <laughs> A few final remarks and then I'm finished, I promise. Uh, <coughs> so the, I just would like to, you know, to, to give some advice to young scientists who plan to become independent and to start their, uh, their own group. Uh, the novelty is the most important thing, no doubt. It's also very important to interact, you know, and don't get scared, you know, of being stolen, your project, I think. You should open, you know, open your ideas, your work as much as you can. Uh, in a group like mine, um, Many times, you know, we had PhD students um, having very good ideas, new ideas, and so uh, I think, um, you know, generating ideas is not um, especially um, for the bus, but it's for the older members of the group. So, so if somebody has a good idea, you know, uh, he or she will come to you, will discuss with his or her friends, and that, that can be very, very productive. Of course, this is our case, jumping from a field uh, in which you feel very comfortable to another field which you are not so happy with or not so familiar with uh, can be extremely beneficial. And I think our group, this is probably the best example of, of this uh, statement. Uh, and do not ask yourself you know, whether you will be good enough uh, to be successful, just do it, you know. And if it fails, I don't think that anybody is going to shoot you, you know, to shoot you. Yeah, you nobody is going to kill you. If, you. if you fail, you can go back to your uh, previous field, and that's all. And uh, I again insist on serendipity. Uh, serendipity, again, is at the origin of many important discoveries. So if you observe something which is kind of uh, unusual, but you do not understand. Don't throw everything to the sink. You know, if you're a chemist, uh, try to understand why you observe what you observe. And on that, I will, uh, I will uh, finish up and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Va urma o scurt, un scurt dialog de 15-20 de minute cu domnul profesor și uh, în cadrul acestui dialog vom putea lua și întrebări din sală despre teme legate de educație, teme legate de cercetare și uh, altele asemenea. Cred că va fi tot atât de interesant precum partea de chimie. Falloir prendre les micros. Technica fonctionne ça. Da.
Am o întrebare pentru cei tineri, pentru domnișoarele și tinerii domn din sală. Vreau să știu cine a folosit chat GPT. Mâna sus! Hai, curaj! Ok. You understood what... You understood my question. Ok. So... Um, Jean-Pierre, Professor Sauvage, thank you very much for your inspiring talk. Vă rog să luați loc în sală, domnișoarelor. So, thank you very much for your talk. I have a very simple question to start with. Will artificial intelligence eliminate human stupidity? Because, you know, Einstein said two things. He said, one, among many, he said many things, but he said that um, human stupidity and the universe are infinite. And about the universe, I'm not even sure. So, will artificial intelligence eliminate human stupidity? So... Um, difficult question, uh, Daniel. Um, artificial intelligence, you know, I'm not sure exactly what it means. I mean, if it is uh, manipulating knowledge, um, okay, I accept it. But um, intelligence, I think there are probably very precise definitions. Can we call artificial intelligence everything belonging to the field of, uh, uh, let's say, informatics and uh, electronic uh, uh, way of reasoning? Because uh, uh, in artificial intelligence, intelligence depends, <coughs> <coughs> depends on what we have provided to the machine, what we have to provide it to the softwares. So, honestly, I cannot clearly answer. I cannot just tell you a small story, you know. Um, in Japan, there is a, um, a, a very nice meeting every year, which is the HOPE meeting, uh, bringing together, you know, supposedly great scientists and uh, younger scientists And I participated in that in 19, uh, no, sorry, in 2017, one year after the Nobel Prize. And there was, the last session was about artificial intelligence. And we were six Nobel Prizes on the stage. And the journalist, you know, who was very good and very professional, asked us, so do you believe that uh, one day Uh, the Nobel Prize will be given to artificial intelligence. And we had to vote. So we couldn't say, I don't know. Contrary to what I'm doing now, we couldn't say, I don't know. And so uh, there was a vote and there were three Nobel laureates thinking that, uh, yes, one day the Nobel Prize will go to artificial intelligence and three others who were uh, totally... Uh, you know, disagreeing. So today, if I have you know, to give my personal opinion, um, I think, yes, you know, I would say that uh, artificial intelligence uh, will receive a Nobel Prize one day. Thank you. The next question that I would like to ask is the following. If you had not been a chemist, if you had not been a scientist, what else do you think you would, you would have liked to be, you would have been, or you could have been? <laughs> um, I must say, you know, since the age of 16 or so, I knew that I wanted to become a scientist and to be involved in uh, mostly in research. Uh, but before that, uh, I think I was also very much interested in music. 
my biological father was a, at its time, you know, a well recognized uh, composer and um, a musician, and that had probably some influence. And I started to learn uh, uh, the piano at the age of uh, nine, and um, I loved it. But for some reason, you know, we were moving all the time uh, with my family. Uh, I could never get, you know, a stable uh, place where I could learn more the piano. So, but music, I, I was um, still very much attracted by music. But your chemistry is very much artistic. It has to do with art. Is the art is it's a it's a kind of molecular art, isn't it? Yeah, I fully agree on that. Yeah, yes. And deliberately, you know, some people may criticize, may argue. So what is the point, you know, in making beautiful molecules? Uh, but you are also very concerned, you know, if I look at what you have done yourself at your work, you know, you have also done very beautiful molecules uh, without any, let's say, any direct connection to uh, applications. But I believe we shouldn't feel guilty. You know. In many aspects in science, when the simple fact that you can do something new is a good enough reason to do it, because many years later, somebody may show up and use that. For exa A very good example is um, lasers. Yeah. When the laser was first <laughs> invented, I think nobody ever imagined that you will do use laser pointers. Yeah. And also when in construction, if you want something perfectly flat, you use lasers to make that perfectly flat. So would you agree with the statement that in science and discovery, the simple fact that the human mind can imagine and can do something is a good enough reason to do it? Yes, absolutely. Yes. I have another example which is equally uh, uh, surprising. Uh, semiconductors, so do you know when semiconductors were discovered? It was Faraday, you know, a famous electrochemist in the UK in 1830. 1830. You can calculate, you know, how many years, almost centuries, you know, uh, elapsed before applications came out. And they came out with the transistors in 1940-something. So more than uh, a century. The touch screen yeah. was invented in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah, the first examples yeah, screen, of yeah. the touch screen. Okay, yeah. so this brings me to another uh, question which I think is interesting, maybe not so interesting for the young generation, but for the scientists in the room. Uh, that is financing of research. You cannot do research if you're not well financed. You don't get financing, yeah. you can that money is much heavier. So that sometimes researchers complain that they have to spend too much time on managing their financing than on actually doing science. A second example, which I gave in the previous conversation, I gave this example um, also with Jean-Marie when he was here. If Einstein had requested money for the theory of relativity, probably they would have said, no way. So, of course, there's a just balance between administrative tasks and scientific tasks. How would you comment on 
this new ecosystem of research financing? Yeah, well, it's not a good, a good thing, you know. Um, I, remember, yeah. I remember when we started on catenanes, you know, they, when I was speaking to some people, some of them were uh, excited, you know, they thought it, it's a nice project. Some others were not interested at all, you know, and they, they were thinking that uh, no need of spending money on a uh, project so, you know, far away from uh, the interest of the other scientists. And, um, and this is a bit sad, but uh, at the time, you know, it was in the 80s when we started, uh, we could apply for money to the CNRS. And there were, you know, some special programs, um, Action Thématique Programmée, ATP, uh, very similar to ATP. And uh, those uh, programs uh, were very simple. You know, you were just writing three or four pages with your project. And this is what I did. You know, I wrote three or four pages on the, the principle and how to make catenanes. And we got the money, good money, you know, that was enough for working for two or three years. But nowadays, I mean, it's unthinkable. No way. If you write a project which seems to be, you know, of no interest for any application, uh, no way. Thank you. Now, here, listening to you and listening to your speech, <clears throat> um, something crossed my mind, and I must ask you this. Um, but before that, I'm going to say a very short joke. Um, a frog and a Scorpio were meeting together, and there was a very big rain. It was raining a lot. And the Scorpio was going to die. He was going to drown. And he asked the frog, he says, please, please, take me on your back. If you don't take me on your back, I'm going to die. And the frog says, but if I take you, you will sting me. No, I promise, I will not sting you. Then the frog takes the Scorpio, and in the middle of the river, the Scorpio stings. And the frog says, why did you sting me? Because now we are both going to die. And the Scorpio said, you know, I'm a Scorpio. So I tried very hard. My, you know, my, my reputation in the public domain is that I'm very provocative. And I tried very hard for two hours not to be provocative, but I cannot anymore. I must be provocative now. So I have a quite provocative question. Um, Please raise your hands. Vă rog să ridicați mâna uh, cei care sunt la umanioare, care, studi- care sunt profesori de umanioare. Limbă, literatură, istorie. Doi. Tata, tatăl meu. Așa. Deci avem două persoane. Așa. Când vine la... Uh, when, uh, so, there are two people from um, humanistic studies. Yeah. When there's a Nobel laureate on literature, the room is full of scientists that come from physics, chemistry, and so on. Of course, humanities and hard sciences, they go hand in hand. There is no question. It's okay, because you know Plato. <laughs> I don't mean to say that there should be a tension between, between humanities and hard sciences. Uh, but you mentioned in your speech how important it is not to give way to obscurantism, not to give way to conspiration theories, not to give way to this crazy idea to cut nuclear energy. You have massive amounts of people 
that asking the streets of Germany to cut nuclear energy. And then they opened the coal mines again, which is totally crazy. Yeah, sure. So Jean-Pierre, please, from your experience, from you meeting so many people in so many areas, tell us your take, your opinion, your thoughts on this tension between humanities and hard sciences and also about the necessary steps to bring scientific culture deeper and more into the public's uh, brains. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Daniel. It's a political question, uh, no doubt. Uh, if you, I can speak for France, you know. Uh, if you talk to journalists, uh, there is a small proportion of journalists who have a very high uh, scientific culture. You know, they know a bit of everything and uh, they can um, learn very rapidly. And I had many interviews you know, with such people. Uh, this is great. But the vast majority of journalists, those you see on television, you know, those who present the news of the day, in France they are almost proud of not knowing science at all. Basic facts of science. Yeah, yeah basic. It's not, I mean, we, no, 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 nobody's sure. requesting to know the details, no, no, but the of basic course, facts of, of science. But you know, they, when you say something and they, they start to, um, to smile, you know, and they say, oh yeah, but you know, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, you know, I'm not interested. Almost in proud. Yeah, almost proud. And I'm sure it's not the only country in the world, you know, uh, many people are not interested at all. Uh, I would also blame, you know, a system which is that of social networks. Social networks. Yeah. Social networks uh, can produce, you know, great things. I, I fully agree on that. Uh, but when you see people who have vague notions of chemistry, uh, you know, who have uh, lots of followers, you know, because they tell things which are totally crazy, uh, and they, you know, their influence is um, by far greater than an expert, you know, who is perhaps much less famous uh, among those networks uh, who tells, you know, something real. Scientific truth. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a Facebook page? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, TikTok? No? I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, okay. Yeah. And uh, ResearchGate, yeah. you know, professional. Uh... Would you take two more provocative questions? Of course, of course. Are there wrong questions? Are there bad questions? No, I don't think there are bad questions. No, in general. No, do, no. do bad questions exist? Uh, I don't think they exist. No, there are bad answers. Uh, in the same way, there are no stupid questions. There are stupid answers. Okay, so I have two more provocative questions. First is the following, it just crossed my mind. In 14, in Strasbourg, we have Place Gutenberg. Yeah. So in 1455, Johannes Gutenberg yeah. invented the print, Tiparnica. At that time, they started to print Bibles. And then they started to spread literacy and then started to be printed science, what we knew at the time. So the printed book brought the incredible development of the Western world that followed. Because the Western world at that time was in a state of development when it was looking for material and spiritual progress. In 1990 came the internet, the second biggest intellectual revolution after the printed book. But at this time, the Western society was rich. We were rich. And we started to use internet for having fun, pour du divertissement. And the incredible power of internet is today more used for having fun for Netflix 
and other kinds of fun, dear kids. Uh, rather than for knowledge, when somebody goes on the internet in general, people go on internet much more for fun than for looking for knowledge. Now we are at the eve of the third big intellectual revolution, okay. artificial intelligence. Could we do something that in our societies we produce a, st a societal state of mind so that people spontaneously go and use these fantastic tools for the search of knowledge instead of... It, it's not bad to have fun. Um, you spoke of the Bible, and uh, the Bible was um, uh, dispatched everywhere thanks to the new printing uh, the process developed by Gutenberg. But it didn't last forever. After, I don't know, I mean, it's impossible to say, but after a few decades or maybe a century, uh, books, you know, uh, cultural books, literature started to grow and to be dispatched everywhere. And so I'm very optimistic in a way. You know, it will take time, but I think maybe this is my nature. I'm very optimistic. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, from uh, stupid uh, entertainment or uh, uh, games or whatever uh, on the internet, the people will gradually be more curious and uh, try to dig, you know, uh, uh, I believe Wikipedia is something fantastic, in my opinion. And so I have faith, you know, in uh, uh, evolution and uh, human beings that uh, they will be more curious than simply confining their activities on, uh, you know, having fun. So you're optimistic about the evolution yes. of this. Okay, so before taking two questions from the young students in the room. Deci, o să luăm două sau trei întrebări din partea tinerilor din sală. Uh, așa că vă rog frumos câțiva dintre dumneavoastră să vă formulați câteva întrebări. Dar înainte de asta voi mai avea un punct de discuție. Uh, Jean-Pierre, this is the last provocative point. But if I may say, you know, this is mind provocation. Of course, it's mind provocation, right? <laughs> Polite, kind. <yes. laughs> it's, yes. So, um, you know, Jean-Pierre, uh, Timisoara, the city where we are in, back in 1989, started uh, what was a, a true revolution. Yeah, sure. young boy when Nazism was over. Two big catastrophes of the 20th century. I moved from communist Romania to yeah. free France. And one of the first things that shocked me in France was the amount of intellectuals, very, very smart people, that they were not sure if the criminal communist regimes that we experienced in Eastern Europe, were they really that bad? There was, so, because people did not experience that, they could not, of course, know until they saw for themselves. But I was always puzzled by the fascination of many French intellectuals, and not the least. Sartre, for example, being one example, with um, what I call and will always call the criminal communist regimes. To formulate my question in a broader sense is the following. 
Society, in order to progress, needs a gradient. There need to be people that know more, people that know less, so that, the, so that those that know less will aim to become better. There need to be successful people that are rich, others that take them as model and they work hard, they become better to be richer. So gradient is the condition of progress. Too much gradient, too much gradient leads to polarization and polarization leads to conflict. So, there are two points on which I'd be very curious. First of all, if you could maybe not explain, but if you could comment on this, what is very strange for us, strange fascination of French intellectual with, with uh, what we experience to be a criminal communist regime, and on the balance of gradient for society in order to encourage, so that to maximize progress, to maximize the desire of people to grow, and to minimize the danger of polarizing too much our societies. Um, yeah, that's, it's, you know, it's a very interesting problem. You know, more than a question, it's a big problem. Uh, if you look at the French, look at them nowadays, you know, they, they demonstrate almost every day. They are very violent. Uh, they are very unsatisfied. And by nature, the French is frustrated. His neighbor, you know, has a little bit uh, more uh, space than himself. He will be envious. He will be jealous. I think this explains that. Also the French, because in, in Romania we have mostly, an expression. Mostly the French. In Romania we have an expression, Samora Cap Vecinoli. In Romania we have an expression, uh, I wish the goat of the neighbor will die too. Oh, yeah, okay. In English they say, you know, the, my neighbor's garden is greener than The mine. grass is greener, yeah. 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 yeah, the grass is greener. But the French are very special. I think they have been educated, you know. Uh, to be opponents. And if you ask a French, you know, in a political debate, um, do you believe that no will be the answer? <laughs> no, the French are very special, honestly. It's also very difficult for me to understand, you know, how people as clever as Sartre and others, many, many others, a generation of intellectuals, you know, they were fascinated by um, criminal communism, as you say. It's an expression I fully agree with. Um, I still do not understand. Okay, so before we end, I would like to take two questions from our young students from the room. Mâinile sus cine are întrebări? Unu, doi. Începem cu domnișoară. Nu văd bine? Domnișoară, da? Avem un microfon? So, first of all, hello. Please introduce yourself. Where are you from? What are you doing? And more, in, mo most importantly, what is your goal in life? <laughs> so, first of all, hello. My name is Sonia Dragan. I'm a student. I'm in high school. Um, I'm from Timișoara. And um, I, I wanted to say that even though I don't know you personally, as it was said before, we are all people. So, I wanted to ask, um, how did you know that chemistry was the, that something for you that you were meant to dedicate your life for? Knowing that in these times, kids are told that it's too much stress to try and change something. And about the goal, I have no idea. But I would say that to learn as much as I can. So the, the, the main question is um, why chemistry seemed to yes. be so uh, attractive to me. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, it's very simple. I was living in the countryside, you know, when I was, uh, uh, let's say, between 14 and 18 years old. And um, I had a couple of friends, you know, it was really in the countryside, in the woods, basically. And in the woods, you know, you cannot do so much. Uh, apart from, uh, you know, um, enjoying uh, nature, 
and I was enjoying nature, but at the same time, I was curious. I wanted to know uh, what makes the leaves green, what makes the rose pink. <laughs> and uh, using my you know, very tiny uh, amount of knowledge you know, in chemistry, I started to extract molecules. I was grinding leaves. Uh, I had a small lab in the cellar when I was 15 or so, and I was extracting leaves to extract uh, chlorophylls, and I succeeded, actually. I could separate uh, various chlorophylls on paper, you know, as chromatography. I mean, I don't know if it speaks to you. And that was very enjoyable, you know, to take things with colors, uh, which you find in your uh, natural uh, surrounding, and try to extract the molecules. Very enjoyable. And I thought, well, that I could try to, to pursue, you know, to do that uh, more when I, when I grow up. So the reason was curiosity, you say? Yeah. And what do you think about the statement that kids are told that there's too much to do and too much work to change something or to make a big impact? I'm not sure I made a big impact at all, you know. I, <coughs> I made, uh, with my group, you know, we worked on trying to first to have the impression that what we are doing is novel, uh, but uh, in terms of impact, again, you know, it could take decades, uh, even more, uh, before important applications uh, come out from the field, you know, in which we have been working or we have initiated in a way. And this is not a problem to us. You know, mankind has still, uh, hopefully, uh, quite a large number of uh, centuries to live or millenniums, I don't know. Uh, and so it's not a big problem if it takes time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Our generation, professors of our generation and my generation, we are used to delayed gratification. Maybe, probably when I was young, I also wanted more rapid gratification yeah, sure. and because life is much faster for you, uh, probably always the younger generation wanted to go faster. And that is also a very good source of progress. That is very welcomed. Okay, there was a second question here. Microphone, please. Yeah, there was someone here. Hello. Uh, Hello. I, my name is Victor. I'm here, a master student at West University Timisoara, master in bioinformatics. Okay. I want to say you a big thank you, and not only for what you said today, but it happens that I also saw you four years ago in 2019 in Paris, uh, where you presented for International Chemical Olympiad Olympics. for school pupils. I want to say a big thank you for what you did then and because you are a very inspiring scientist and you also inspired me to go into, into science field. And now, uh, going to my question, and I hope it's relevant for every young student or for all people who want to do science in their career, um, how do you think it's the best to, fi to find life balance between work and between family? and how to do great science and still be able to raise happy kids? Now, that's a very important point, very important question. <clears throat> I can speak about my personal experience. of our group and so even on vacation you know I could never stop thinking or even reading science but that was very well accepted by my wife and my kids uh, so they were reading or watching TV and I was trying to read a paper you know scientific paper and that was it but it was very well accepted 
Thank you. And maybe also the last one. You said that unfortunately you didn't took any Romanian student for your PhD yeah, or yes. as a postdoc. I just want maybe you can give an advice to the students in this room and maybe to all Romanian students. What qualities would you search for in a PhD or postdoctoral student to take him into into anything? Which kind of field? You mean research field? Or? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe which personal skills or what qualities do you search for in people to work with you? Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, via, for the people who are looking for, uh, let's say, a good place, a good university to do studies, I think you have a very good place here. But if you want to go abroad, thanks to Europe nowadays, I mean, you have many, many possibilities compared to the past. And so I think everybody should take advantage of that. To use Europe, there are networks, now, lots of networks, good networks, uh, not, uh, <coughs> you know, toxic uh, social networks, <laughs> but good networks. And so I believe it's relatively easy for uh, a student from uh, Timisoara University to get, you know, an invitation to do something else abroad. And in terms of field, you know, if you are talking about field, um, if I had to start again, you know, my scientific life, uh, I think I would get closer to biology. You know, biology is really fascinating. And combining chemistry, you know, the, the ability of chemists uh, to make new molecules and biology uh, can be really something great. Thank you very much. Okay, so we, is there one more question from a student? No, yes. She was. Last question. Um, she was hello, I am Denisa, and I come from Anaslan. I'm a 10th grader, and I just wanted to ask real quick, but first I must say thank you for this, uh, however you call it. I'm really a fan of talking to scientists and maybe other people in this field, mostly because I am very passionate about biology, but, okay, sorry, I'm a little bit awkward. Um, so my main question is, uh, can you like, um, sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit awkward. So most people usually just discourage you from a thing mostly because uh, like, oh, you're too young to do that or oh, you're not good at something. And, and the problem comes with maybe you're good at that, but like, you don't have to listen to people sometimes, do you? And my main question is, can you do something that you want to do without other people influencing you? No way. <laughs> you are the product of your environment. Yes, I just want just to ask a little bit. And also, do you think that anyone could uh, be like a very uh, aspiring person, even if they don't come from the best school, they don't come from the best family, or like they don't come from uh, a very popular like place or family or whatever? Because from what I've seen, a lot of people do say that, uh, oh, you must have a very established uh, lifestyle or established uh, reputation to do something, which for me, I don't think it applies to everyone, but I just want to know your comment on that. No, no doubt, you, you don't need to come from a rich family, nor from a, a good place. I give you my personal uh, case. Um, so you've seen pictures. I was in North Africa. Back and I was moving all the time. I was not a very good uh, pupil, you know, I was not a very good student either. I became um, a good student at the age of, let's say, 16 or 17 when uh, my situation got more stable, you know, it stabilized uh, close to Strasbourg and then I, I was better. But before, you know, um, I was 
let's say, in the, in the average. Okay, thank you very much. So, unfortunately, it's time to finish, not before inviting... Domnule Rector, vă mulțumim foarte mult pentru că ne-ați oferit această fantastică posibilitate. Un cuvânt de final, vă, vă rugăm. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Savage. It's a great privilege for us to have you here. And uh, till today, you are a member of our academic community. Uh, mulțumesc frumos, domnului ministru Funeriu. Mulțumesc frumos, doamnelor și domnilor, dragi studenți, dragi colegi, dragi elevi. Uh, Universitatea de Vezi Timișoara, în an de capitală europeană a culturii, a asumat două proiecte mari. La UVT, Cultura e Capitală și Nobel la UVT. Lighting up your city este sloganul capitalei culturale, iar noi, Universitatea de Vezi din Timișoara, încercăm prin mințile luminate pe care le aducem aici să luminăm orașul prin știință, educație și cultură. Mulțumesc frumos tuturor! Și nu uitați, dragi tineri elevi, Că la UVT, jobul nostru este viitorul vostru.